Today, this, you know, session, I call it the not so best time of the day to be listening to somebody. And um, I just want us to know that uh, uh, it's going to be a challenge. You know, the theme given to me was triumphant over life's challenges. Your first one is to keep yourself awake this afternoon. That's your first challenge this afternoon. But I want to thank everyone who's responsible for me to be here. I consider it a privilege this afternoon uh, to share the word and what God has laid on my heart. Um, I want to bring warm greetings from Urban India Ministries, the ministry that is going to celebrate 25 years next month. And so just thankful for what the Lord has done. So here we are fighting from a place of resting in God. Wow, that's a whole lot bundled together in a phrase. We're all sitting so comfortably. The ambience here is like amazing, but I have to take you away to really see what does fighting look like for you and me this afternoon? How can you and I face some of our fears? Are we afraid of the battles that we are currently fighting? Or maybe it's there, you know it's coming soon. Are you afraid to be wounded in your fight? Does it feel scary that there is a fight? Or maybe this afternoon you're sitting here wounded and weary from the fight that you are fighting. Whatever it is, I want you to be battle ready. And that's what we're going to look at this afternoon. Are you and I battle ready? Do you have any clue that all of us are going to be fighting this battle? Life's challenges are not supposed to worry you. They are supposed to help you know and discover who you are, firstly. They help you to discover how far you can go, your inner strength and your inner ability to actually face these challenges are very visible when you're in the fight, not otherwise. And finally, I believe life's challenges help you know who your God is. And I think that's the critical one. It's through our challenges that we get to know God closely. And I think the morning sessions have just been one that has shown you the word, how you can have peace, how you can, you know, overcome some of your challenges some of the brokenness, some of the difficulties, sometimes how you have to just drag yourself from one day to the next, just having enough courage, just enough grace, just enough strength to pull through. But I want you to just be reminded this afternoon that all of us are in this fight. None of us are exempt from it. If you are a child of God, then you are in this battle. You will have challenges, difficulties, and struggles just because you belong to him. So I want to ask us, when you know that you are getting ready for a battle or a fight, how do you prepare? What are the things that you will do to equip yourself for the fight? As a soldier of Christ, just think about how is your preparation for the fight? You know, and beautifully the scripture talks about that in John 16, 33, that in this world you will have struggles, but I have overcome the world. And because of that, there is hope. 
And I want us to focus in terms of the preparation on a chapter from Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians 6, verse 10 following, talks about the armor of God, isn't it? And I'm sure you've, had, you've heard endless messages about the armor of God, what it does. But if your armor is not ready, then you're not ready for the fight. If you don't have your belt in place, if your sword is not sharp, if your shield is not in its place, if your shoes are not in their place, then you are not ready for your battle. And I think Paul was writing to the Ephesian church knowing that each of them are going to have to fight their battles. How I wish that just because Jesus has done the finished work on the cross, that these battles were taken away from us, isn't it? Many of us wish ourselves away from the battle. We just wish, oh, it, does, it shouldn't exist, or the battle should not come, or we even pray that way. We say, Lord, I don't have the courage, I don't have the strength, I don't have it in me to fight this battle, Lord. So let it just go away. Let it just disappear. But the scripture tells me battles don't just disappear. They're there. And you and I need to prepare to fight for the battle. So be equipped. Be equipped because each one of us are definitely going to be fighting this battle. What, do you, what other thing that you should know when you think of a battle is that you need to know your enemy. Because the scripture in verse 12 of Ephesians 6 says, for you do not fight against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers of this dark world. Know your enemy. He is the father of lies. He's cunning deceptive. Sometimes you don't even know where he's going to show up from. And if that's the kind of enemy you have, how much more should you strategize to fight your battle? So know your enemy. Know your weapon. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 4, and I want to read that for you. You know, know your weapon. What are you fighting with? If you don't know that, pretty soon you'll be defeated. Because if you are going to focus on what you think is the weapon that you have to fight your battle, it just might not be enough. And 2 Corinthians 10, and I want to read this verse, it says, the weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. So your weapons are different. Your weapons are not the weapons that the world will fight their battles with. And that's why you and I have a very different way that we will fight our battles. So know your enemy, know your weapon. And Romans 8.38 says, Nothing, nothing that the enemy will do can ever separate you from God. So you know what the end result of your battle is already. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. Ephesians 1, 15 to 21, and I want to read that for us. It says, for this reason... Ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. Be enlightened, you know, in the order that you may know the hope to which he has called you. Do you know what your battle will do? 
your battle will help you know your God better. Always remember that he who created everything, even the principalities and powers of this dark world, it was in him that everything was created. He has got this in his control. Know your God. If you choose to spend time to prepare for your battle, you need to spend time to know who's going to help you through this battle. You know, none of us probably would go into the battlefield wearing our jeans and our t-shirts. Would any of us do that? We wouldn't, we wouldn't dare do that. We have to put on the armor. And as it says, you know, in Ephesians 6, therefore take up the whole armor of God and you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. That is an amazing promise for you and me to hold on to. If you want to win your battles, or actually this, we've, he's already won it for us. But if you want to win that daily struggle of thinking that, when is this going to end? When is this difficulty going to change? When are my problems going to stop? You know, Jesus' words should encourage you to say that in this world, you will have troubles and challenges of many kinds. He did not say that we are going to be exempt from it. He did not say that, you know, we can do without it. We can somehow just fly away and overcome these things. No, that's not what he said. And that's not what he did, right? He was willing to stick his neck out and actually fight for you and me. So I want you, my friends, to recognize that the battle is real. This is not an imaginary battle. This is real. I want to take you to Exodus chapter 14 where, you know, the people of Israel are fleeing from Egypt. And we have this scene where, you know, they are faced with these mighty waters before them. And the Egyptian army is right behind them. And Moses, their leader, is encouraging them. He's saying, do not fear. Do not fear. Moses affirms to the people in Exodus 14, 13, he says, do not fear because God is going to fight for you. Do you have that assurance? They did not, because it's interesting in that passage, you know, as I was reading that, Moses knew that God had the capacity, you know, to fight this battle. He knew he was going to do it. He was sure of that. He was encouraging the people to believe that. But here they are experiencing the waters right in front of them and the Egyptian army behind them. As you go through the battle, sometimes it looks like God is not hearing me. God is not helping me face this correctly. Look at this impossible situation. The waters in front and the enemy behind me, pursuing me. But just at that time, you know what happened. They experienced God's hand just as he had promised. And it's not just that they experience God's hand. You know, they walk through that dry ground, but the enemies saw it and they started fleeing, saying that the Lord is fighting this battle for them. Remember, your enemy knows very well that he's already defeated, but he will do everything he can to distract you in the battle so that he can make you a casualty. Unless you and I know the promises of God and we cling on to them for dear life, we will not make it through. So here these people of Israel experiencing God's hand in this battle, which is massive, huge. And then verse 25 of Exodus 14 says, Then they feared the Lord and put their trust in him. Sometimes. You and I 
need a battle to really trust God. It's very easy to sit in this beautiful hall and to say and sing that I trust God. Easy. Out there in your battlefield, probably it's your home, I don't know. Maybe it's a difficult relationship. Maybe it's your children. Maybe it's your family. Maybe it's your workplace. I don't know where your battlefield is. But out there in your battlefield, can you put your trust in God and say that he will fight this battle for me? I think that's what battles teach us. That they have a process through which you have to go. And that's why it doesn't seem to end, right? In our battles, if we don't learn our lessons early, woe to us. Because God is such a loving God that he actually allows us to go through some of these battles because he loves us. Because he wants us to put our trust in him. In that battle, he showed up. Right? Right in the midst of it. There they were with the waters in front. But these very same waters became a wall. The very same ground, which was, you know, the waterway became dry so that his people could walk through it on dry ground. That's what the scripture says in Exodus 14, 13 to 29. So here was a real battle that the people of Israel were fighting. I want to take you to another battle. Why does God allow us to go through battles? It's because he's shaping you and me. He's shaping our faith. He's shaping our understanding of who he is. He's shaping us in a way that we will display his splendor to those around us. That's God's purpose for a battle. And the theme this afternoon was battling or fighting from a place of resting in God. And if you and I know what resting in God means from scripture, the many verses of scripture that I read, I came up with these three things about resting in God. The first one is that God invites us to rest in him. So in the thick of your battle, you know, Pastor Arlene was talking about that peaceful picture, isn't it? I want to tell you another secret today. You know, when there's a severe storm, it's really bad. There is one place that is absolutely peaceful. Does anybody know which place that is? Yes? The eye of the storm. Thank you. The eye of the storm is the most peaceful place to be in. And so God is inviting you and me. You may be in a very stormy place this afternoon, but God is inviting you to the eye of the storm where he is. And that's a peaceful place for you and me, even when there is a storm. And then he instructs us to rest in him. God instructs us. God says, I want you to come and rest in me. That is an instruction that we see in the scriptures where there's an invitation. And then when you're in a relationship with him, he's instructing, he's commanding you. He's telling you, come and rest in me. Why should we rest in God? Because he did it before we can do it, right? When he created the world, in Genesis we read that God rested from all of his labor. God knows that we have the potential and the capacity to keep working night and day, endless, seven days a week. We can keep doing this. And so he's telling us, I created you also to rest, recoup, and rejuvenate so that you'll be ready to face your next battle. How encouraging. Every day, sometimes, we're fighting battles. But can you and I fight our battles 
from our resting place in God? Is that a possibility? Maybe some of us have. And some of us have experienced what it means to rest in God while being in the midst of a storm. While being in the midst of our battle, just trusting him, knowing that he'll see me through. Because that's what he did for me earlier. My experience of being in God should be what helps me to go forward and to find that beautiful resting place in him. This afternoon, he's inviting you. Are you weary? Tired of the battle you're fighting? Just dragging yourself through? He says, come. Come to me. All who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. I will give you rest, he says. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. What a beautiful promise. That God is saying, you're dragging your heavy burden. This afternoon, give it to me. Come, give it to me. I will take it. And I will give you my rest. And so you and I are called this afternoon to fight in a way that we are so sure that we are in God. And that our victory is sure. That's why... It's more easier when you know your enemy, when you know the weapon with which you're fighting, and when you know your God, you can make it through your fight. And I want to draw your attention this afternoon to a very familiar person in the scriptures. Hannah, from 1 Samuel chapter 1, verses 1, and I'll be you know, looking at multiple verses over the two chapters, the first two chapters. Interestingly, Hannah's name means, you know, the favor or grace of God. Before Samuel was born, I wondered if Hannah many times wondered, really, do I have the favor and grace of God? Year after year, the Bible tells me, this family is going to worship at Shiloh. And year after year, Elkanah's second wife troubles Hannah. She's irritating her. She's mocking her. She's putting her down. She says, you, you don't have any children. Look at me. Look at me, accomplished mom. Because that was a huge title to have in those days. May not be today anymore. Motherhood shunned by many, opted out of by many. But in those days, being a mother was what women looked forward to. They considered it as a privilege to be a mom. And here was Hannah really struggling, struggling from that place. You know, she was a wife of Elkanah, and all of us know that. It's in verse 2. She was part of this family that, you know, where worship was part of their lives because it's repeatedly said that they went year after year to worship. Verses 5 and 6 caught my attention. Elkanah was telling Hannah, don't worry, I'll give you the best portion of meat. You know, am I not better off than 10 sons if you had? He was trying to comfort his wife with whatever he knew. But was she getting comforted? No. She was not getting comforted. It was not enough. Whatever he said was not enough. And we see that God had closed her womb. And it doesn't say it once. It says it twice. Verses 5 and 6 says, The Lord had closed her womb. And then verse 6 says, Because the Lord had closed her womb. And those two books. You know, phrases caught my attention. As a result of that, what do we see? This woman yearning to be a mother and her childless desperation is repeated there. Three things I see from Hannah's life. Hannah wrestles in her brokenness. You know, till that verse about where they go to the temple and they're offering their sacrifice, and Penina is 
really irritating her with her mockery and putting her down very intentionally, we see that Hannah was wrestling in her brokenness. You know, wrestling with the stigma of being childless that carried a huge stigma. The pain of being childless. And in 1 Samuel 1 verse 8, it gives us a perspective of what she was yearning for. She was yearning to have a child. And in this brokenness, we see Hannah just wrestling. She's just wallowing in it. And remember, the Bible says, year after year, this was happening. This was not one particular year. Year after year. And so every year when they have to go up to the temple at Shiloh, this was happening. So every year was a traumatic experience for Hannah in that broken place. And probably the continuous reminder through the year that she was childless. And so I want you to ask yourself, what is your brokenness? Are you aware of it? Are you willing to acknowledge what it was? For Hannah, it was her childlessness. But I want you to look at your own life. What are those broken places? Acknowledge it. Be aware of those broken places. And that's what really will help you. Even as we go forward, you will understand. So here we are, Hannah, wrestling in her brokenness. The second aspect that I want to talk about is that Hannah finally decides to take this brokenness to God. And she goes into the temple, weeping, wailing, pouring out her heart to God. And the Bible says in verse 10 of 1 Samuel 1, weeping bitterly in deep anguish, she decides to take this brokenness to God. You know, sometimes we keep our brokenness locked up, closed in. We're so scared to even open it up because we're afraid of what we are going to experience in that broken place. Unlike the battle of the people of Israel, which was a very physical battle, I think Hannah's battle was emotional, mental. It was a different level of a battle. She was finally willing to say, okay, Lord, I'm going to open it. I'm not going to keep it closed up. I'm going to let it out. I'm going to let other people see what I'm feeling from this broken place. And so she pours out her heart to the Lord, praying in great anguish and deep grief. And Eli thinks that she's drunk. And he says some words to her. And then she expresses what she is there for. She says, Please don't misunderstand me, my Lord. I'm here because I'm praying for a child. When you decide to take your brokenness on your knees, that's a different way to fight your battle. But that's the right way. And that's the right place to bring your brokenness. Maybe you can share it with a friend, your husband, you know, maybe in your ladies' group, in your care cell group, you can share your brokenness. That's okay. Your therapist. But when you bring your brokenness to the right place, and that was in prayer, just like Hannah did. You know, the Bible tells us in Isaiah 35 and verse 3, strengthen the feeble hands and steady the knees that give way. You know where we fail often? It's in our prayer life. Your prayer life is not visible to everybody. You can fool the pastors, you can fool the care cell leaders that you are a spiritual person, but it's your prayer life that will determine whether you will win your battles. That's where you win actually. Therefore, Hebrews 12 and verse 12 says, 
strengthen your feeble arms and your weak knees. I think as a body of Christ, this is the place to take our pain. I don't think there's a single person listening to me online or here who has not experienced emotional and mental pain. Something that we would have gone through. We lock it up, we cover it up. They look at us and behind that beautiful smile lies some of the most painful stories of our lives. And so let me invite you this afternoon to come to the right place with your brokenness. In prayer to the Lord, there's no greater place that you and I can have than at the cross to give our brokenness. And finally, I see Hannah wrestling. Her wrestling leads to her blessing, isn't it? There she is. In verse 18, till then she was refusing to eat. Her husband was saying, why are you like this? Please eat something, you know, probably he's telling her sleep, you know, get some rest, don't cry, please don't weep. He's trying to comfort his wife. But after spending time in God's presence, we see Hannah is convinced that God has heard her prayer. And how do I say that? Look at verse 18. We see that she gets up and goes her way, she eats something and was given strength from above. There was something that happened in that critical moment of her time with God. She heard God, I believe, because her actions say totally different from what she was doing before, isn't it? She was wallowing, weeping, crying, doing all kinds of things to express her pain and her hurt, and here we see her get up, eat something, you know, and the, her face was no longer downcast is what the scripture says in verse 18 of 1 Samuel chapter 1. There was a clear distinction of the Hannah before this and what happened to her in her time with God in prayer. Very clear. And then it says she went and rested as a result of what she had just experienced with God. Probably she heard a voice, I don't know. There was an affirmation that Eli, what Eli said, go in peace and the Lord has heard your prayer. Through the prophet, through the you know, priest, she heard it. Maybe she heard a voice inside of her heart saying, go and your prayer is answered. I don't know what it was, but when Hannah got up from that place, she definitely got up knowing that something is going to come, that her victory was just there. You know, early the next morning, we see in verse 19 that she goes with her husband to worship before the Lord, and then the family return to Rama. Her posture is one of deep faith and hope in the answer that is coming. And we see that she comes back to the temple the next morning to pray and worship with her husband. What an amazing transformation of the woman in chapter 1, verses 1 to 10, isn't it? The weeping, the bitterly crying, the one in deep anguish, the one in deep grief has a transformative experience. She is changed because of what happened in the temple when she went to wrestle with God. Do you know sometimes our battles are not so much like the physical battles that the people of Israel repeatedly fought. Many of our battles are emotional and some of them may be physical. But a lot of times we go to the wrong place with our battles, with our fight. We go to the wrong people with our fight. If only you and I have the ability to wrestle with God, to go into his presence and to really expose our very inner being to him and show him who we really are. Unlock those places of brokenness before him 
and open it out to him so that he can see it. Not that he doesn't know that it's there. It's just that he waits for us to take it to him. He doesn't just make it disappear. Oh, how I wish he would do that. Just disappear, Lord. My pain, just take it away, Lord. It doesn't happen. We struggle with it. And many times we struggle alone. Let's be like Hannah, you know, be willing to go into his presence and experience God. You know, as the person introducing me said that we're from Urban India Ministries, this organization did not begin because we thought, oh, we need an organization now. It started almost 25 years ago with just a group of friends who just saw crumbling marriages around us, who felt that our own marriages were really not good enough. What is going on? Why is it that Christian families are falling apart? And we decided that we're going to do something about it, at least to our own group of friends. And so we gathered together for a conference, invited a speaker and said, just talk to us on family. And how do we live out our Christian faith in our homes? Because so often our faith stays limited to the context of the church. Many of us don't know how our faith can be translated into our families. How does faith get translated in your role as a mother, as a father, as a husband, as a wife? Is there something about that translation? I think you and I have to explore that because God never wanted us to just live out our faith on Sundays. He wanted it to be practiced on a day-to-day -day basis within the context of our homes. And so here was this group of friends just struggling with, what do we do? This is an ocean of struggles. My own friend was going through a divorce at that time. And I said, what can I do to help? I felt so helpless, so helpless. And that's when we started thinking of, why do we wait for families to break up? Let's start investing in families from the beginning. Let's build strong marriages. And so with that goal, we began just a... You know, few of us uh, in our own brokenness, with our own marriages, struggling, just very young married, maybe four, five years married. Some of us were not even married when we started thinking about this. And I remember that, you know, as we contemplated together, we wondered how, how are we going to, this looks like a huge ocean before us. How are we going to help restore families and broken marriages? And for four years, we just were a group of volunteers, friends who came together, did something, and then went back to whatever work we were doing somewhere in the secular world. My husband and we were, you know, missionaries in North Karnataka, Gulbarga at that time. So we really did not know what God wanted us to do. But we just came once a year, did something for families and went back. And for four years, we did this voluntarily. And then finally, God placed this heavy burden on our hearts to begin this, to come, take it on full time. And so in 2002, we left our youth ministry in Gulbarga and came to Bangalore to really start doing something about broken families. The need was much, but from 2002 to now 2023, I look back and think, wow, that's amazing what God did. But I want to share one story. I have many stories to share, but I want to share one story from this journey. In 2012, we had decided to move out of our, you know, home come office. That time we were operating in Tipasandra. There are some of you who know where we operated out of. Selena was, had joined us there. You know, she worked for us for a while. And in that place, you know, God began to do something, teach us, actually he taught us on the job. It's like you push somebody into the water and say, okay, now learn to swim. Because we had no, you know, training other than Bible college training. And so we wondered, how are we going to do this huge task? The task looked enormous for us. But even as we were doing this, it was at that time that we, there was a need for us to move out of the place that we stayed in. 
and we started to look out for some kind of a building or you know construct our own space and we were looking for a land and um, we found one in Henur we started raising money for it and just about maybe you know we have were short of um, some 20 plus lakhs to register the land that we had found and we had kind of exhausted every person that we knew to ask for funds have you ever done fundraising such an exciting thing isn't it hard difficult you ask everybody you know and then everybody tries to avoid you when they see you have you been in that place when they see you coming this way they'll go that way if i see this person they'll be raising funds and we reached a point where we exhausted everybody that we knew and i remember we were like desperate to raise money and my husband you know he, one of his brothers was in abu dhabi at that time and his brother said why don't you come here and why don't you stay in my house and maybe we'll ask a few friends here because before you know the next month we needed to raise about 23 lakhs or so to register and to finalize the property and so my husband went to Abu Dhabi listening to his brother there was a program that was conducted there uh, in his church in his brother's church so he did the program hoping that he could talk about fundraising but they announced that you can't talk about your funds you can't raise funds in this church. So he spoke, he finished, and he came back. He couldn't speak about the need for funds. He was so desperate. You know, so he was getting upset with his brother. He said, you told me to come. Now so many of my days are stuck because I'm in Abu Dhabi. At least in India I could go and maybe see some more people. Just the desperation when you need to raise funds. And he was upset with his brother, his poor brother. <laughs> Not enough, he paid his ticket and took him there. But anyway, you know, he just decided to close the door and go on his knees. And he said, Lord, I don't like to do this. You know, this is so, like, demeaning. And he said, Even as he was on his knees, he heard the Lord. And this is what the Lord told him. The Lord told him, this building is not for you. So when you ask people, don't say, UIM needs a building. You say, the master needs it. So he was like taken aback. Was it a voice? Was it an inner voice? He's still not sure. But he knows he heard the Lord. And he said, that moment, it was like the moment Hannah had. That experience in the temple where the Lord said, I will do this. Why are you worried? Why are you fretting and worrying about this money? I will do it for you. And he was telling us, you know, he got up from that place feeling not just the land is done but the building is done that was what he felt and I think that's what Hannah felt isn't it she got up from that place was she pregnant no could she see anything about being pregnant no not at all but she knew in her heart that God had heard her and that's what happened even for us where we knew that God had heard that prayer. And in the next one month, miraculously, the money came. And I wish I had the whole afternoon to tell you the stories of God's provision. But he did it. Not just the building, not just the land, the building as well. You know, when we started constructing this building, we used to really worry, how will we pay this contractor? We have to pay these guys. But God taught us something. You know, when the bill would come, no? The money will come. From where, we don't know many times. Maybe we had sown the seeds, asking people for funds, and it is gone, gone, gone. But when the bill came, only the money would come. And every month, we were able to see so much of money coming, and my husband was like, wow, if money is going to come in like this, then we can pay all our staff really good salaries, and, you know, we can do all of these things. 
But does God want us to live out of our plenty? Or does he want us to always go back to him? He wants us to always go back to him. When we finish building our building, money stopped coming. Stopped. Go back to your knees, my children. Seek me and you will get. So what I'm saying is, do you have that encounter with God where you hear him so clearly that you get up from your place knowing this task is finished, this battle is won, knowing that I will be able to face whatever challenges that are on my way. I don't know about you. Do you have experiences of God like that? Isn't that beautiful? To be on your knees and to hear God, to say, this, I've got it in my control. You just keep plowing. You just keep loving. You just keep serving. And I've got this in my control. Hannah was strengthened in her battle. You know, sometimes we, we struggle because we don't have the energy. We're so wounded and weary and tired from the same battle. But here was Hannah when she's writing her prayer in chapter 2 of one, uh, 1 Samuel. She says, it is not by strength that one prevails. The Most High will thunder from heaven. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth and he will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. Do you feel that you don't have strength to fight your battle? Do you feel exhausted this afternoon, whatever your battles are? Don't worry. He promises that he will strengthen you. He's the one who you have to look to and the strength that you need will come from the Lord. One of the biggest challenges we face when we have, you know, to fight our battles is that fear grips us, isn't it? We have so many fears. How, Lord, am I going to do it? How am I going to talk to somebody? How am I going to argue my case? How am I going to present this differently so that I will be understood? So often, our fears literally eat up our faith. This afternoon, let me encourage you. Let your faith grow so big that it will eat away all your fears. That you will have so much faith to be able to endure the battles that God has set before you. You know, the root word for fear in many forms, they say 437 times it is included in the scriptures. And many times when the people of God were getting ready for war, you know, the priest was supposed to call them and he was supposed to encourage them by using this word, do not be afraid because the Lord is going to fight your battle. Now when God had given the promise of the, uh, to, you know, Joshua to go and conquer the land, did you know how many kings they had to fight along the way? 31 kings. Just because God gave the promise, Joshua couldn't just walk into the promised land, Canaan, and take over. They had to fight 31 battles along the way to conquer the promised land. And so, I want to encourage you with what the priests encouraged the people of Israel, that do not fear. Do not be afraid of any of the battles that are up against you. No matter what form they take, no matter how difficult they look to you, God is in the business of fighting your battles. And therefore, do not be afraid. What was Hannah's victory? Even as I was reading and just thinking through, she asked for one. She got six. She pleaded for one child. And the Lord gave her six children. Victorious Hannah. Probably every time, you know, she used the name Samuel, it was a reminder of why she named her son Samuel. 
The meaning of the word named Samuel is the Lord has heard. And that was a reminder for her to keep going because the Lord is our God who hears our prayer. Just want to pause. Maybe in your scribble pads, I want you to just reflect. Write down one or two battles that you are right now facing, emotional, physical, maybe it's a sickness, maybe it's a challenging job that you have, maybe it's a target that you have to accomplish, whatever it is, just put it down there. I'll give you a couple of minutes before we go into our activity. I don't know, I asked Selena if she can put out some papers and some sketch pens, I don't know if you already have it on your desks, for those of you who are online, may I request you to find an A4 size paper, get some sketch pens or color pens or whatever you can find in your house. Yes, all of you have it at your desks. Even as you, yeah. So, just take, take your papers and I'm going to for those of you who are sleeping, you need to wake up because you can't sleep anymore. You have to do this activity if you want to do the activity. Okay, so take out your own paper. Please sit nicely, comfortably around your table so that you can use both your hands. Adjust, shuffle, do whatever. Make sure there's a book under your, or a, your writing pad is under the piece of paper. Or you can use your writing pad, if that's fine. I hope if there's somebody who hasn't got the color pencils or something, just raise your hands and they'll bring it to you. Make sure that everybody has a piece of paper with them. If you are sitting only as one or two at a table, I request you to join another table for this activity, please. Even three people, could you please just join another table? Turn your chairs around and just join another table. For the next few minutes, we're going to be doing an activity. So please, at least have five, six, or four, five, at least, at a table. So please go shuffle, find another table and join another table. Thank you. If you want to stand and do the activity, you're free to do that. Just to stretch. Okay, I think most of us have got our papers, the front few uh, chairs, yes. Okay, each one, take one paper. Each one of you, one paper. Each person, one sheet. If it's only one sheet, but each person, one sheet. So can you raise your hands, those who haven't got paper? Do we have enough paper, Selena? Yes? No. You, do you have enough? Otherwise, okay, otherwise just use your writing pads. Those of you who don't have, I wanted you to take this home, but just use your writing pads, no problem. Okay, now, we're going to do something called a scribble activity. Those of you online, I hope you're ready with your pens and your papers. Now, all of you close your eyes, put two pens in two hands. You need two pens, not one, or two uh, sketch pens, whatever you have. Make sure that it's on the paper before you close your eyes so that you don't be scribbling on the tablecloth. Okay, put both the pens on the sheet of paper and close your eyes and just scribble. Enjoy yourself, just scribble. Okay, go ahead, close your eyes, put both the pens on the paper and just scribble. Those of you online, go ahead. Close your eyes, that would help. Make sure you don't go off the paper, but 
Yes, scribble. Scribble, scribble, scribble. Till I count ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Thank you. Now open your eyes and look at the scribble that you have made. If this was your mess, or if this mess was to depict your brokenness, your battle or your pain, what would you title the image that is in front of you? If this was your brokenness, your battle, your painful situation, what would you title the image or the drawing in front of you? Go ahead. Don't share it with others as yet. I will give you time to discuss. This is just for you. Just for you. So give it a title. Give it a name. Put a heading there. Whatever word that describes it. You want more than a word? Go ahead. More than a word, a phrase. How would you describe that mess? Is everybody through? Or you're still thinking? Yes? All those who finished, raise your hands if you have named your picture. Some more to go, so we'll give them a couple of minutes to finish it. Those who haven't finished, title it, name it, write a phrase, whatever you feel as you look at that mess. Now you have some colors on your table. I want you to take the colors and I want you to make a meaningful picture of that mess. Did you understand? Yeah? Look at it. Add some wings, make it a butterfly, or do something to that and make it look beautiful. Add colors to your mess and make it look beautiful. Use the colors, sketches. If you need more, we can ask them to bring some more. Or maybe there are tables which people are not sitting at. You can grab some from there. Take a few minutes to make your picture meaningful.
No copying. Okay, I see some of you have finished, but we'll give others who are very creatively designing their picture some more time. If you have finished, give your new picture a new title. And what would that be? For those of you watching online, we're sorry you're missing being in a group, but you could do this activity. So give your new picture a new title. If all of you at a table have finished, then I want you to write a poem from whatever is emerging from the themes of all of your pictures at the table. Discuss. You want to write a poem, you can. You want to make it a chorus, you can. You want to write four lines. You want to put a tune to it. Go ahead. I'll give you... 20 minutes to do that. So really be creative. Women, I know that you are creative. So come on, go ahead. Discuss what came out of your picture. You know the before and the after, what you wrote before and the after. What are the themes that have emerged in your group? Write it down. Create a poem or if you want to make it a chorus or a song or whatever you like to do okay and whoever is willing can come forward and present it to the rest of the group is that good so i'll give you 20 minutes go ahead discuss talk share your pictures with one another And this picture is for you and for your group, if you're willing to share your pain, your story, you know, this is for you. You don't have to submit it to me. You don't have to show it to me. Go ahead, groups, get creative. Come on. Yeah, it's a poem for each table or a song for each table, not for each person. So discuss together and maybe make four lines of a chorus or four lines of a poem or put together something. Come on, get your creative juices. You had like a wonderful khana given for you. Get going.
those of you who haven't finished see if the microphone is on okay he's brought another one thank you thank you go ahead can you tell us okay, your Ch name uh, agnes go ahead agnes now we have uh, uh, some very interesting pictures drawn here i won't be able to show but i'll tell what it is um, some hurricanes and then a uh, flower was drawn so the title was the calm in my hurricane the calm in the hurricane yeah. wow and then uh, some pictures which looked very chaotic and confusing and they made it as a shield and said understandable chaos and my shield was the title thank you <clears throat> and then some mountains scribbled mountains and then there's no title here so that's okay and um, another picture which looked all knotted so uh, agnes completely knotted and then i put in little hearts everywhere and said in god's love thank you did you do you have a poem or four lines yeah we written? have done a poem four yeah, lines yeah please i'll read go ahead poem. and read your poem okay i'll read the poem yes In the midst of hurricane he is the calm even when problems mount he leads us into green pastures he is my shield through chaos he gives me new life out of my brokenness god's love is bubbling over thank you next group please and then you can come the microphone please take the microphone you want to read the poem together go ahead both of you can do it together just read the poem or sing the song or whatever you did together and later on you can share your scribble art with everybody if you'd love to yeah the poem yeah yeah you don't need to share all the art just share this poem just share your poem together you have your poem yeah please go ahead and share check okay what uh, what we have done our group is hold the mic closer yeah yeah uh, we we say uh, our poem says says reads like this in the midst of chaos and confusion god is still working the masterpiece still to be unfolded we are his workmanship in progress that means god is not finished with us he is still working on us god can st god can still god can fill un if only we would let him in so god can only fill us and if we can if we are still and if we let him in the other line is he makes everything beautiful in his time if he at it won't he won't he won't give up he makes everything beautiful in his time and he doesn't give up on us Thank i mean you. we give up on him many times but he doesn't give up he's still mindful of us and he's still working on us and he's still shielding us and covering us and protecting us thank you thank you for that go let's not waste time as many as can share go ahead go ahead just keep going broken to victory broken to victory yeah helplessness later it was blessed mm -hmm. uh, the song has come in my mind it's a hindi yeah. song please uh, kisne tha socha ki aisi daya milegi humko bharpuri se युगो का राजा महिमा को छोड़कर अपनाया मेरे शर्म और गुना क्रूस से मैंने पाई है माफी मैं हो गया उस राजा का सुंदर मसीहा अब मैं हूँ तेरा यशु मसी तू है आशा मेरी हाली लूया प्रभु तेरी स्तुति हो हाली लूया तू ने हराया मृत्यु को तू ने तोड़ी हर जंजीर तेरे I know 
we all have songs to sing, but since our time is limited, be quick, be, um, you know, so other groups get an opportunity. Thank you. Go ahead. Messy lines, messy lines, full of confusion. Here I submit in, your lo in the Lord's hand. Now I see the ray of hope and love. And I feel like a butterfly full of colors. Thank you. The first poem. Let's okay. all give them a hand. Nice. Go we ahead. all five drew uh, different size and different colors of butterflies like this. Uh, we scribble and then it turned out to be a beautiful butterfly. All of us remember, I think, one song. If I were a butterfly, I thank you, Lord, for giving me wings. If I were a robin in a tree, I thank you, Lord, that I could sing. If I were a fish in the sea, I wiggle my tail and giggle with glee. But I just thank you, Father, for making me, me. Thank you. We got butterflies, a tree, robin, bear, so I'm not going to sing what she sang, but we made the chorus as, uh, For you gave me a heart, and you caught me on my knees. Change my brokenness and transform me. And I just thank you, Father, for making me victorious free. Yay! Nice one. Go ahead, go ahead. Let's not waste time. Let's hear all the songs that come out. Yes. This is not a song. A so our whatever. team, we had a combination of scribbles, which changed into butterflies, flowers, and a uh, uh, lot of uh, what? Petal, petals what and flowers. yeah, all those natural things. So uh, we combined all the keywords of the negativeness and the positiveness from, from our entire team and composed this. Okay, the poem goes like this. Looking back at the chaos, not knowing of worries and sickness will dissolve ever. As a caterpillar not knowing who I am, cocooning myself into a ball, until my God frees it all, giving me wings and beauty as a butterfly. Thank you. Amen to that. Go ahead, go ahead. Uh, these are words from everyone in our group. So it is new, cre new creation to do something, a coffee without faith like sugar, I will be lost without the sugar. Something new out of a mess, from tangle to me uh, sorry, from tangled mess to wholeness, from bo broken to wholeness, with God on our side, and we are His prophets. That's Thank you. Thanks. From tangledness to wholeness. We were reminded of uh, the Japanese art kintsugi, where you have. Uh, completely broken, broken pieces. pieces and then gold inserted in. That's what we were thinking about. This is our poem. It's my brokenness, it's my mess. Our world is dystopic, our world looks absolutely sick. His glory unveiling mysteriously, recreating a beautiful me. It's my brokenness, it's my mess. In the end, he's perfecting my wholeness. Amen, amen to that. So Sheba made these um, uh, two, <coughs> these her circles as <coughs> uh, fruit producing trees with uh, roots deeply rooted and uh, Carlina's sister made two, um, this, what that is called? Okay. Uh, 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 they, the, they are shining bright lights and um, Sarita made, uh, created a girl broken her chains and <coughs> freedom, freedom in a mess. I made uh, it as an uh, apple with seeds, and we have all together made a poem. <clears throat> Though we live in a world which is a mess, we are here to bless. We continue to shine like a deeply rooted vine. In him rooted to thrive, in us Jesus to drive. Freedom in a mess to only become beautiful and the best. Thank you, thank you. Please give the mic to the next team. And could we make it a little more faster, the next team, be ready, and just be quick so that everybody can present it. So we have a short poem from all the drawings that all of us did. The confusion in my life was too knotted 
a tangled maze even though it was an impossible and glorious mess but yet it seemed pretty when suddenly i felt an inward happiness i felt like a smiling swan holding a creative balloon filled with simple joys and nice things thank you uh, our table came up with a poem just on the titles that each one of us gave our images so this is a small poem from our table caught in the crosswinds i was on a different tangent caught in the co- in the in the toxic mess my mind was anxious wondering when this time will pass but a wind blew over my heart teaching me that love conquers all tranquility came as i began to trust without borders now there's no turning back thank you amazing maybe you should put it in your church bulletin or something some of these poems okay from our table we named our scribbles like chaos confusion carelessness ashes but from all the beauty we could put inside we made this poem so our poem goes like in a world of chaos and carelessness he raises us beautifully from our ashes and molds us into his masterpiece thank you beauty out of ashes i think we all did the same thing took the words and made poems out of it so <laughs> uh this is what our group came up with maze turmoil chaos overlapping darkness creations of our weakness new birth new song emerging beauty out of nothingness colors in darkness god's word brings it to pass thank you yeah so the the first picture um we titled it scatter brain okay and uh, out of this came this uh, lovely little uh, lines rivers of god flowing serene flooding my mind with peace and seen and beautiful and the uh, other picture was um, the random uh, scribbles was called garbage and nonsense <laughs> and then it became jeans garden so out of nonsense came sense out of chaos came order out of barrenness came toil out of garbage came beauty thank you uh just like everyone we came up with a poem as well as a song uh, as a team so we'll just go with the poem first and then we'll go with the song yeah tough the battle is needing the strength to move i know who god is for he is on the move The battle is not mine alone the battle belongs to him and my light won't grow dim for victory belongs to him alone so a uh, song and tune everything came in 5 minutes so i hope you still enjoy it so when the battle was tough everything was a mess we just stood with each other to become victorious oh we built the ground we dressed the we fixed our eyes on the creator oh that's how we got our peace our friends of peace thank you thank you you need the young people to be creative thank you thank you for that song <laughs> Hi everyone. So we also clubbed all the titles and made it into a poem. So here it goes. Once lost and suppressed, a veil separating your world and mine, sobbing in the ugly depths of this valley of shadow of death and cries. A uh, confusion and fear that once was my habitation, your light tore the veil and now I am found. New flowers bloom in this hopeless wilderness. music flows and i dance to your living grace yeah thank you thank you two more groups i will just read the titles of our uh, if uh, if you could move to the center because the yes yeah i will just read the titles which will explain our scribbles and drawings uh, one is and unt- untangled becomes a woven tapestry tangled becomes a vibrant mosaic confusion and chaos becomes a garden with butterflies and uh, an entangled uh, scribble becomes harmony so emotions thoughts tangled and entangled lord i do not know what to do on my knees i saw my light the twins became 
It come together into a vibrant mosaic, a harmony, and a wave woven tapestry. Thank you. So we started scribbling like any other, and these are the pictures that we came up with, a beautiful woman, a fish, and a butterfly, flowers, and all of that. And uh, from that, what we made was, when I lost myself in the scribbles of life, knelt down in faith, kicking off the fears, and was able to see through the spring of flowers, having wings of butterfly, and strength to swim like a fish in the ocean of scribbles and glow for him. Hi all. So we also came up with a poem and we got different scribbles. So one was a tortoise. So we got a tortoise and then we got a confused face and then we had uh, valleys and mountains and uh, we had a face, um, you know, facing to God. And then finally we had hearts of seasons like, uh, you know, this. So we came up with a poem and we named it as Anchored because in all of the situations we want anchor that's God. And here it goes. In a life of ups and downs and seasonal tides, face steps with him turning towards my savior makes all the challenges take nothing but just bows unto my savior. Thank you. Thank you. Two more groups to go and then we can... Oh, sorry, I didn't see this side. And we have the online people. So once you all are done, we'll move to the online people. As, as well. we scribble, we see only kind of a messy thing over there. So we have titled this Mess, Chaos, and um, what happens when God comes to it? Glory comes, the presence comes, the light comes, and your, your designs can turn into flowers, it can f turn into gardens of God. So the order turns to... From chaos to order is our theme. The title of our poem is Order in Chaos. All I see is this mess in me, messy and lonely. God has changed me completely. Your love changes my mess and stress. May you be more and I be less. Lord, you are sufficient for me. Let the flower bloom and others see. You are all I need, my friend indeed. Glory, hallelujah. The light has come, oh yeah. Thank you, amen, the light has come. Just come away from the speakers, otherwise they will hum. Just come to them again. We had a list of confusions, entangled pain, hurt, and battlefield. And it turned out to be a beautiful picture of a sky, bird, and sun reflecting towards the God's light, and waters and fish. So it's all linked to what God has created and it turned out to be, um, it can go beyond what we are thinking and what we are going through. Just keep trusting and looking for God's word and the answer and everything is in the Bible and confess the word of God and you will move forward. It won't stop. Only by the word we can move forward and go through. Thank you. Can you give the mic to this group please? Thank you. Uh, so our scribbles also, we, we got some pictures like the birds coming out of the cage and the seeds that got sprouted and the trees where we got fruits and uh, a flower which we made as a bouquet. So the words are like fear turned into freedom in Christ, un, uh, embattled, unending, landed and sprouted, um, overthinking, lack of coordination which was into clarity and focus. And here's a poem which uh, she's going to read. So the poem goes like this. Seeds sprout, wings grow, the embattled, unending choir gets landed and grounded in his redemptive touch. Tangles become seeds, dandelions fly, illegible scribbles grow, fruits and roots appear. Isolation and disconnected becomes a fragrant bouquet in his redemptive touch. Thank you. Thank you. One last group before the online... Good evening, everyone. Um, 
Uh, from our table, we have come across three pictures. Uh, the first one is the scribbles, uh, which is made, made out of a question, and then it has been beautifully shaped as a sun. And the verse says that the sun of righteousness shines bright amidst all the chaos and all the darkness and the mess. And the second thing is uh, the picture of the cross. The mess, even in spite of the mess and the battle and the chaos, we always look upon the cross. And the third one is the metamorphosis, where the silkworm undergoes the struggle to fly out to become a beautiful butterfly. So uh, we just came up with a poem that I'll read out. Um, in my cocoon there I lay, all covered, all closed, cocooned away in my old, own world of pain. No one to hear, no one to see. That's what I thought in my misery. How wrong I was that I did not see. The one who died on the cross was forever watching over me. He was there all along the way. He stood, he watched, he held me in his way. Shaping, molding, holding me till I could a beautiful butterfly be. Thank you. And now let's go to the online group. Okay, so there are quite a few um, you could pick poems. Few. I will, uh, yeah. yeah, I'll pick two yeah. of them. Yeah. Uh, one is by Mariama Matthew, and it says, I give my agony, my fear, and my anxiety unto the cross. In goes a new hope, faith, peace, and deliverance into my life. Every weakness is transformed into strength on the cross. And uh, the second one is by Sarah Sunil. Uh, it's, when I feel down, when I go in circles of disappointment and discouragement, I know, Lord, you are there. You hold my hand and lift my hand. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. 